The next paper is Investigation of an Acute Role for Non-Neuronal Cells in Pelvic Pain and Bladder Dysfunction in a Novel Mouse Model of Experimental Autoimmune Cystitis. Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Anne Hannah Mitchell. I'm a physiologist. Uh, recently moved uh, to work in the Department of Urology at Case Western Reserve University, and I'm happy to present today some um, humble uh, preliminary findings uh, working uh, on a, um, a mouse model of uh, autoimmune, um, experimental autoimmune uh, cystitis. I have nothing to disclose. I'm partially being paid by in the institution, some by myself. And uh, let me go straight into the uh, um, topic of my talk. Uh, so we'll go straight to the uh, subject of painful bladder syndrome interstitial cystitis. It's a chronic visceral syndrome. It's characterized by urinary frequency, urgency, and pelvic pain. The prevalence of PBSIC uh, is greater in the female population. In the USA alone, approximately 3 million women suffer from PBSIC. That is not to say that men do not also suffer from this um, uh, chronic, debilitating, painful condition. In fact, it has been officially recognized as a disability in the United States. It has a profound impact on the quality of life, affecting work, uh, constant uh, uh, toilets, uh, runs, uh, affects everybody, uh, irrespective of their job position, whether they be a night shift worker, a nurse, a conveyor belt worker, a neurosurgeon, constantly going to the bathroom and the chronic pain can affect your ability to hold down a job. It also affects your social life and also affects sexual life. Um, therapeutic strategies for the treatment have failed to produce clinically significant results. So the underlying etiology of PBSIC has actually not been defined. There are many ideas as to what can lead to uh, this uh, debilitating chronic pain syndrome and all of them are linked to um, a dysfunction of the urothelial barrier, that is the epithelial lining of the urinary tract. There seems to be a consensus there uh, that the kickoff point is in the epithelial lining of the urinary tract. And do I have a pointer? Is there? Um, so uh, I have a schematic here. I have an h &E of a bladder from a cat. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a, a laser pointer. Is there a laser pointer? Just the mouse. The mouse. Okay, so I won't delay. So if you actually look at the, the top left corner, you've got the image of the urinary bladder. Right at the surface of it, you see the urothelium, and you can see that it is poised. It is a, a positioned at the interface with the contents of the bladder and the underlying tissues. So the urothelium is a very important blood urine barrier, and it also protects the underlying tissue, because right below the urothelium, you've got sensory nerve endings, you've got motor nerve endings, and below that as well, and into interstitial cells, you've got to choose a smooth muscle. So right below that, we see the colorful schematic, which brings up the urothelium itself. It's heterogeneous. The very top cells are called umbrella cells, and they're highly differentiated to meet the challenge of rebuffing or keeping out entrance of the constituents of the urine itself, and to some extent, the water. OK, sorry. So, um, the umbrella cells express uroplacans, and these are, these are integral, uh, intrinsic um, uh, membrane proteins right in the very topmost uh, layer, the surface, the apical surface of the topmost cells. So these uroplacans form a very, very important barrier function in the urothelium. So going back to what I said about the underlying etiology in PBSIC, that there is no consensus, there are lots of theories, possibly all right, being that the, uh, the uh, underlying etiology is, is quite possibly multifactorial, but they're linked to increased permeability in the urothelium and or neurogenic inflammation, leading to upregulation of sensory signaling from the bladder to the central nervous system. So in this mouse model, uh, which was set up based on the work of Fouat, who is not here to present Bisser, he did it for his uh, doctoral um, uh, studies, 
Um, the uh, mouse was uh, inoculated with a protein, a partial protein from a uroplacon, uroplacon 3 alpha, and it actually uh, provokes an autoimmune response attacking the urothelium. And in this mouse model, they observed um, uh, appearance of uh, pelvic pain and also of bladder dysfunction. Um, 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 exhibited by a uh, higher frequency of urination and lower voided volume. Um, this would fit in with the theory that in the subsection, uh, subgroup of patients with uh, PBSIC, that autoimmune uh, pathology may play a role. And it also fits in with the fact that there are lots of comorbidities with PBSIC, such as inflammatory bowel disease. Actually, it's been tied in with fibromyalgia, asthma, and lots of other um, uh, pathologies uh, connected to epithelial cell physiology. I know I'm, I'm excluding fibromyalgia there. So getting straight to the study, in this study, and um, the uh, mice are inoculated uh, with the, the peptide, uh, a sequence uh, of this uh, uroplacon 3 uh, alpha peptide, and uh, the vehicle is um, complete Freud's adjuvant. And the animals, um, in initial studies carried out by the group, the animals are monitored at day 10 and day 40. And at day 10, they saw the occurrence or the, uh, ex um, the of uh, uh, visceral sensitivity, which was assayed using von Frey filaments uh, in the pelvic region and the hind paw, and also the occurrence of increased uh, frequency of urination and lower voided volume. So on coming to, to work with this mouse model, I innocently asked the question, well, well, how about earlier on? Why are you just looking at day 10? What happens earlier on in this scenario? What about at day five? Uh, the thoughts were based on the study, and the study was in collaboration with an immunologist, and the theory was that, and I don't know very much about T cells, I have to admit, that you would not see, expect to see activation of T cells at uh, earlier time points. But in any case, we started up an acute study to have a look, say, what would happen at five days in these, uh, in these um, animals. My expectation was, well, if you're attacking the urothelium, uh, you're definitely going to see some damage in the urothelium, and the expectation would be, you know, uh, uh, that there would be some destruction to the surface cells uh, uh, upon examination, histological examination, and that you'd see urinary frequency and pain. But we were wrong. Um, so what we observed was pain at day five. No evidence of urinary frequency or urgency. Uh, in, uh, again, we, uh, in another um, timed uh, study, more chronic, at day 10, again we saw that you see the pain, which had started at day five, and then you see the appearance of the urinary urgency and frequency, and you also see destruction to the urothelium. So going back to day five, we see the occurrence of pain. So, the question was, normally you would expect that the urinary frequency and urgency would be mediated by an increased activity in the A-delta sensory afferents, or at least that was the thought in my head, and that by activation of glial cells in the spinal cord, you might trigger um, effects on the C-fiber afferents by lowering, lowering the threshold of activation. Glial cells, microglia and astrocytes, are now well established as playing roles in the initiation and the establishment of chronic pain at the level of the spinal cord. It's now known that they interact very intimately with nerves, they can release neurotransmitters, and they can actually mediate in the uh, chemical dialogue between incoming sensory afferents and secondary sensory afferents. So they actually can uh, jumble up the, the message that's coming from the periphery. Um, so, wanted to have a look for some further proof, even though the von Frey filament examination, and I'll go back to that slide, certainly showed a heightened sensitivity in the experimental autoimmune cell um, uh, uh, mice. Uh, we see with the Freud adjuvants, there also is an upregulation, which is not surprising. Uh, when we actually looked at the spinal cord, these are preliminary findings. In the dorsal horn, there was evidence of activated microglial cells. Activated is just based on their anatomical, their their morphology. Uh, 
uh, microglial cells are the macrophages of the central nervous system. Normally, they have processes. They're stellate when they're quiescent. And there are normally not quite a lot of them about. When they're activated, you see a higher presence in the area. And not only that, they round up and they have a macrophage conformation. So in the spinal cords of our EAC mice, we see evidence of activated uh, microglia. And not only that, I've put in this slide here, you actually see the movement of the microglia up to the surface of the spinal cord. Indeed, there is evidence in the literature and from my own studies uh, with Laurie Berder in, in Pittsburgh, where you actually see the migration of the microglia cells up to the surface of the spinal cord, where they might actually have a fact on the, spine, on the blood spinal cord barrier, but we have no evidence of that. Um, so here is a schematic just showing how incoming uh, signaling from the uh, sensory, sensory fibers into the dorsal horn uh, are met by uh, the microglia and also end processes of the astrocytes. Um, the role of, uh, micro, of glial cells in the mediation or the establishment of chronic pain is that the microglia are activated firstly and that later on in the scenario that the astrocytes are, uh, are activated. In the acute model, we didn't find evidence of activation of astrocytes being that they didn't co-express more primitive um, intermediate filaments such as vimentin and nestin, but in this 40-day study that we've recently uh, completed, I'm most inter interested to go in and have a look for the, um, the uh, profile on the astrocytes. Uh, just looking at the bladder function very quickly, uh, in the five-day animals, um, on the left, we see pre-immunization on the left bar in each group, and on the right, we see post-immunization in the EAC group, in the vehicle control group, and the naive group. And uh, to the left is pre, and to the right is post. And there really was no significant difference in urinary frequency in the EAC group, just focusing on the left group there uh, in frequency, nor was there any significant difference in void and volume. Uh, Data that we have from 10-day post-immunization uh, show that um, in the EAC group that there's a higher frequency um, of uh, urination and very significantly a lower uh, voided volume. Total uh, urine output was no difference between the uh, test group and the vehicle control group. So, conclusions. Pelvic hyper, uh, hyperalgesia is rapid in onset. The question is, are the C fibers being directly activated um, that, that's, that's the only logical conclusion I can come to. While we didn't see any damage to the urothelium, uh, the urothelial cells can change without showing obvious differences upon histology, i.e. they're very sensitive, uh, they are very um, active cells, they release neurotransmitter. So it's conceivable, hypothetically, that the urothelial cells release uh, neurotransmitters that would apparently directly activate C-fiber afferents. It was just something that we were not ready for, and it's very interesting. The, um, the onset of bladder dysfunction is seen at 10 days, which correlates which, with damage to the, the urothelial barrier where you see disruption. At that point, it's logical to understand that you have entry of the urine to the underlying tissue may, where it may activate um, the uh, sensory afferents and bring about the sense of the message of urgency when there really is no necessity to void. And activation of dorsal horn microglia at five-day EIC indicates the potential for early onset of central sensitization, laying the groundwork for chronic pain. And acknowledgements are Dr. Farooz Danishkari, who has worked very hard on these animal models, Fuat Busser, who did great work for his PhD, Wen Shu Huang, who had visited us from um, uh, Taiwan, and Michael Cavern, who was our lab manager and a very astute person and a good scientist. Thank you. Thank you very much.